All right, Hi, everyone. Welcome to lecture three. So, um, I'll try to keep my voice down. Um, so let me know if I'm too quiet, just to um, make my uh, voice the uh, hope my voice goes out these days a lot, so trying to keep it down a bit. Um, so, um, first of all, I figured out how to how what would be the best way to use the iPad. Um, so I'll actually share that uh, screen now. Hmm. Okay. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'll go out, install the plugin really quick, and then come back. Actually, I don't have to go out. Never mind. So annoying every time. Okay. Yeah, I really hate remote class, actually. It's everything so annoying. Virtual class. So it was working like uh, five minutes ago and it's not working anymore. Just a second. All right, finally, now we see um, you're seeing my iPad. Um, all right, so I'll just close this. Okay, so let me begin today's lecture. And again, uh, let me know during lecture anytime if you have a question. Okay, so first, um, a few announcements. And then I'll go to um, a review of the linear algebra just to actually correct a few things in the last two lectures. 
and then I'll be moving to uh, recapping neural net for image classification. Then uh, we'll be finally actually going through the text classification with word embedding and recur recurrent neural networks. So announcements, first of all, reminder that the class, class website is again, um, this link. So everything is being uploaded here. So I'm, um, I'm not using QLMS um, uh, much except for making important announcements. So probably I'll, I'm, I'll make an announcement when the coding assignment one is out, but then other than that, all the materials will be online uh, on this website. Um, and the assignment number one will be out uh, hopefully by this Friday, um, working with TAs to get this done. And um, number three, the assignment will be relevant to um, lectures 01 to 04, which is basically um, up to next week, Monday's lecture. And lastly, um, yeah, lastly, uh, please use GitHub discussions for questions about the um, assignments. Excuse me, Professor, we cannot hear you. I think you are muted. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Ka. Yep. Let me know anytime, please. Like, um, yeah, think of this as a more of a live class. Thanks. I don't know why I was muted. Okay. Yep. So the review first. Um, so yeah, so I, I made a mistake. I mean, uh, I, I, there was a notational um, really convention that I was not Con, uh, consistent on with the uh, the uh, the convention. So, um, and there is a reason actually this confusion uh, happens, and I think it would be good to review that because many of you might be also be confused. So, when you say y equal w x plus b, this is um, basically we are mostly operating in um, what's called column vector. So suppose that um, y is um, two by one vector. So something like this. And then we multiply that. We are uh, saying that this is a multiplication of um, basically, no, oh, my bad. So what I'm saying is this is basically a multiplication of two by three uh, matrix. So when you say two by three, usually you um, mention the, the number of rows first, which is uh, vertical. So two by three matrix. And then you multiply that by uh, three by one vector. This is X, right? And then um, plus um, B will be same dimension as Y. So it's two by one vector two. So that's how usually, um, Um, do for the um, this kind of notation that W comes um, at the front. That's uh, there's no problem with this. The only issue here is that usually uh, people, you know, usually get confused um, when you have to do multiple uh, number of uh, matrix multiplication. Um, it's it's and what's it's more convenient to think of this as you multiply you transform x into something by putting the w after x instead of in front of x. That's why um, there are people uh, there are actually people who try to not not uh, put it this way. Um, this way means uh, this like this x w y. Um, so if you do this way, um, the difference is now then uh, you're now operating in more of a row vector than column vector because um, that's, uh, you have to do that way. I mean, you will see. So basically in that case, y will, y will be, instead of two by one vector, it will be one by two vector. And then um, what you're doing here is, oh, no, I mean, sorry, not bad. 
So I'll actually clarify again. Yep. Um, so the here then x will be um, x is something like x is just here is like some number. I'm not saying it's x actually. So I mean you can replace that with the probably. Yeah, some vector. But now you see this one by three, right? Not three by one. And then um, you have a W of three by two. Um, and B will be um, one by two. And that's why Y will be actually now uh, one by two as well. So it's just flipped, everything is flipped. But then, um, so what's what's good about it and what's bad about it? Good good thing about it is that, it, let's say if you want to just uh, do another, uh, you know, multiplication of matrix, it's more convenient to actually write down as, um, you know, X, W, V, something like that. It's actually more convenient when you're coding with PyTorch TensorFlow, um, rather than putting W at the, at the left, because it looks like, um, it, it. I mean, if you put W on the right, it, it, it's more convenient to really um, think of it as a transformation. Uh, but bad thing is that because uh, mathematically people are usually um, more uh, convenient with a uh, column vector when they're mentioning vector, but then here now you have a row vector. So it, you can get confused with that, but it, it, it's essentially there's no difference, just the, um, the notational um, conventional things. And the mistake I made was actually then, um, so when you're multiplying uh, matrix with the vector, it's always um, the column column wise in the second part. So it's, it's basically this I'm saying, not the other way. Um, so I think I mixed that up, sorry about that. But uh, now you get why this is happening in general because um, you want to, XW is a usually more convenient form to write code or um, some pseudo code than WX. But still um, in this um, class, I will stick to the uh, WX plus B for now, um, because I think when I'm writing, it's more mathematical than code, um, but um, hopefully it's not an issue or um, there is no problem understanding that part, the difference. It's uh, the conclusion here is that there isn't really much difference. Okay. All right, so actually just one second, I'll just open the door, it's really hot. So let's go back to the um, um, recap. Let's recap the uh, image classification that we went through last week, or actually Monday. So, um, so remember that in MNIST, the inputs are the uh, real numbers, and they are um, um, what was it? Twenty-eight by twenty-eight um, matrix of um, values that. Each value is corresponding to grayscale color. So um, that's why um, each input can be considered as a real number, a vector of real numbers of uh, 786. And then uh, we want to map this to um, Y. And I told you that when we we're doing classification, uh, we want to be operating in probabilistic um, space. So we want to map this to a probabilistic distribution. And that will be basically to here we have 10 classes, zero to nine. So it will be real number of 10. But of course, um, each um, I will be in the range of a zero to one and summation of Y I. Will be one point zero exactly because this is a probability distribution and we use softmax, what's called softmax to really um, obtain 
these constraints. Um, and we used a simple neural net to go through from X to Y. And the way we did was something like this. So um, because X is a simply just a vector, so a uh, simple neural net will be something like um, Y will be, um, you first uh, put X here and you uh, transform with W um, and then you add a bias. W and B here will be learnable uh, parameters. And then we have a simple um, non-linearities. Um, this is ReLU. And then um, let's say this is a first weight and first bias. And we go through another layer of uh, um, the um, your network. So it will be something like W2 and then uh, we have a plus B2, that was second layer. And then uh, we just put this into um, softmax function that we learned in the last lecture to obtain this, um, the, this constraint. So hopefully you remember all these things. Okay, so um, actually, yeah. I will skip this slide, but uh, we were motivated in the last lecture that um, text classification is a bit different because um, here the input is not real number like image and also it's not fixed size. Um, as you see, it's a text and text is, um, unless you, you transform this into some like bytes, it's not really a continuous real number, it's discrete values and also of course um, input text can be um, have has a it, ha it can have a variable length so it's not weird if you um, basically have to deal with um, much longer text than this but the task itself will be quite sim uh, similar too I mean in this case we're trying to classify this text into um, two classes either um, good review or bad review. So here, of course, then number of classes, I'll just put that as C will be two. Um, in image classification, this C was 10, by the way, right? I mean, the MNIST. So then how can we do this? Um, so here are the input side and output side. If you look at each individually, um, the output side is fine. I mean, we, we know how to deal with this, right? We just learn how to do classification with neural nets. But then the problem is that input side, because input side um, is not super easy because um, not real and also variable length, right? So that's why exactly uh, we saw this um, slide, right? Inputs are not real numbers and inputs are not fixed size. So we're gonna see how we can uh, uh, resolve these issues. Um, so I told you that this will be about word embedding. And number two, we'll be using what's called recurrent neural net, RNN. So let's get to these, um, each of them. Um, so text, um, um, word embedding, right? Um, so actually in uh, word embedding and actually um, you have to also mention tokenization because how people actually approach this problem is that you first um, divide the text into several smaller tokens. You can think of tokens uh, as a word, um, but it doesn't have to be a good word by the definition of humans. But one easy way to really do that is just divide the text by space. It's quite simple, right? In Python, it will be just dot split and space, right? But can you guess what the problem will be in this case? Um, so the problem is actually then, of course, other things are fine, but how about the question mark, right? So um, dot split, um, it's quite powerful in many cases, but sometimes these um, exclamation marks, or maybe there is a comma in some sentences, 
um, it's not easy to handle that with uh, just simple split functions. So what people usually do um, instead of uh, just doing um, just uh, splitting, um, people um, have a quite simple regular expression that tries to split um, these um, non-alphabet and um, alphabets and adding a space between them to kind of so that they can have a um, separate token between in this case, for instance, movie and the question mark. So people use what's called regular expression and uh, shorthand for that is usually reg X. Um, so uh, we'll not go into these much. Um, I think even if we do, I'll, I will give you a simple script to do tokenization, but the, you can just think of it as you, you're giving some rules, right? Uh, you tokenize or you split um, two, um, you split a word into two when you see um, uh, some this punctuation symbols or you see a space, of course, or maybe you can put dash and these other things into this, your rules so that you can have a quite um, good separation between words. Um, and we want each token to be meaningful by itself, right? So then when we do that, what we're basically getting is if we tokenize this, then we'll be getting an array. I'll just write in Python syntax, something like this. Who said, this was good uh, good movie. And lastly, if we had some regular expression, then question mark will come at the end, right? So hopefully this tokenization process is not um, super hard. Okay, nice. Um, so, uh, going back to actually the previous slide, and now one important thing we need to um, mention here is that what is the uh, length of the tokens? And here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? So it's uh, the length of the token, we'll use t, t for this, will be eight. So far, so good. Yep. So um, next thing is word embedding. So um, why are we doing this? Because now we have separated the text into several tokens. Now what we're doing is that we want to map each word or each token into vector space. And for now, let's assume that um, we somehow have a vector corresponding to each word. And hopefully ones, uh, the, those embeddings have some meaningful locations in the um, high dimensional vector space. So as you see, um, if word embedding, somehow we learned it somehow and we somehow placed those vectors um, or maybe, I mean, maybe in more uh, non-training uh, method, maybe uh, someone is, could, be, tr could try to um, map these words in a two-dimensional space and group things that are very uh, similar in their meanings. But um, we'll soon see how we can actually train these. But let's assume that um, we can put these words into uh, some vector space. Here you're seeing two-dimensional vector space, but um, it can be very high dimensional. These days we're going up to something like 1000. Um, a few years ago, we were operating in uh, around 100. So you see that like they're uh, group, grouped by um, similar items. So LG, oven, refrigerator, microwave, GE. These are all appliances. Um, there are other things like um, what is it? Finish, color, paint. It's something more about you know doing uh, painting. There are more things about um, I think um, I'll say kitchen. I don't know some some other groups, right? So as you see, uh, words will uh, be clustered according to what their meanings are. We hope that that can, that can happen. Um, once we have done that, then what we can expect now is that we just separated the um, um, tokenized text into, um, say, eight tokens, right? So we had a text here. So I'll put this here. And we basically um, separate this 
into a token. So suppose this is text is input text, so it will be X. So I'll put X1, X2, X3, X4. So suppose that we did that um, with the tokenization, we'd call this tokenization, right? Then um, we're going to map this into vector space by using the word embedding because we assign a vector for each word, right? So I'm going to use um, a bit different way of writing X here, um, basically this X. So that's what's called uh, word embedding. Then now we have this uh, four vectors and suppose that each vector is um, say 100 dimension for um, just easiness. Um, so we're mapping each word to 100D. Then we can think of this as um, in a simplest case, we're basically saying this is kind of a big matrix, which is in the dimension of um, four by 100, right? So it's, um, you have a four vectors with size 100. Or you can flatten this out um, to something like 400 vector, right? And then maybe now you see this is a similar problem to image classification, right? Because image classification, we were assuming that the image is a, a real vector of 768 dimensions in MNIST. And we just saw that if we could do already embedding, then maybe we can translate this into um, real input, not um, some real number input, basically. Then maybe we can, can we apply something similar to image classification to um, get the um, two outputs, right? Um, Y1, Y2, these were the uh, probability for good review and bad review, right? Actually, um, it's more it's more accurate to say that this is just um, one vector, and this is real number of size two vector two vector of size two, and of course, again, there's a constraint. This is a power distribution, so we want to have the constraint that um, this is each number is um, zero to one, and also summation is one point zero. But the question is, um, does this work? So um, can you think why this would not work at all? Um, well, actually, I'm skipping this. So there are actually issues, right? Um, the problem is that. Um, If you are trying to um, get the actual embedding somehow, um, so for, for instance, um, actually, I, I actually forgot to mention this, but um, you can actually, I'll go back to slides again. So you can actually make this uh, word embedding as uh, something that you learn too, because the word embeddings are basically parameters too, right? They're 100 dimensional parameters corresponding to each word. But uh, if you um, are trying to just randomize those things initially and then try to somehow find good embedding during the, uh, the training the model, there's an issue of uh, um, can you actually do this well if you have words in test time that you have never seen? Uh, we'll get to this again next week probably um, that when we're dealing with the training, um, we're not going to, we're, we're, we haven't covered training yet. We are just thinking about inference for now. But I wanted to mention that um, that's about this problem. Um, so, oh my gosh. So we'll uh, discuss this problem again next Monday. But um, the, just for now, think of it as, if you haven't, you haven't seen the word during training um, or when you're um, tuning your model for a task, it's impossible to actually encounter for um, 
what you want to when you're encountering new words during test time. And, and that's usually happening because the training data for the target task um, is oftentimes limited. What that means is that suppose you want to do um, some inference for the um, movie review class classification, right? The original example. And suppose that you only have like uh, 10,000 examples. And in these 10,000 examples, um, you will be seeing a lot of words, but still you will uh, encounter some words that you have never seen in the test time, right? And that's where this problem happens because you cannot do anything about words that, ha that ha haven't been seen during training. That's actually core difference between um, um, the image and the text because in the image, there's no such thing as um, unseen word, right? I mean, every kind of, um, I mean, there's unseen type of um, pattern, but then we're hoping that the model can generalize so that they can learn how to classify. But then um, in the NLP, because each word corresponds to one vector, if you haven't seen that word during training, there's no way that you can handle that in during test time. And that's exactly because the training data is oftentimes limited, right? Um, maybe something like um, 10K examples. So that's like a one a big problem. Um, and the training data here, of course, is uh, labeled that you need to have human labels. It's um, limited by nature. You cannot have infinite number of labels or a large number of labels um, of uh, good or bad reviews, right? But um, the, the idea here is that can we then instead utilize a vast corpus of text data that has no labels, just like any text that you see online or you know, in your textbook, um, anything. And that's exactly the motivation for creating a pre-trained word embedding or um, often called word to vec And this is a really um, very important um, I think a discovery or advancement in NLP because um, while BERT or pre-trained models um, have been developed, I mean, these like language model, pre-trained language models, for those of you who have uh, already um, heard about it, have been developed quite recently. Um, the word to vec or word, um, the pre-trained word embedding has been around for a long time. And we knew that it was actually quite useful. Um, the only difference is that there's a big difference still, but is that the in the pre-training, pre-trained word embedding, you are trying to just pre-train um, word to a vector, but then in the pre-trained language models, it would be more of a, um, you're also considering context. But this, but this was just for those of you who are familiar with BERT or pre-trained uh, language model, but if you're not, just don't worry about it for now. Think of it as, um, can we uh, utilize um, large corpus of text data without labels um, to obtain uh, fixed word embeddings so that we can somehow um, um, resolve, or I mean, we can somehow handle unseen words during training. So uh, now I'll be talking about what's called skip gram. And this is actually um, Mikolov uh, 2014. Um, sorry, I, I forgot to put it here. You can actually see that in the on the um, schedule too. Um, so um, what is this? So I'll introduce you uh, what the model is trying to do. So what the model is trying to do is that let's say that we are given um, in a text corpus um, a five word text, something like, you know, we're going from here. Um, I'll just do, just you just, just drew a random text, something like um, I love to swim at, and let's say that it goes on. So it, it's not uh, exactly um, complete sentence. It might have some words after the sentence um, or it might have words before I love to swim at. But just, we, let's say we just look at this window then uh, what the model is trying to do is that it's trying to guess um, 
what the surrounding words will be, just looking at the word in the middle. So you look at the word two here, and you map this into um, a vector. It's basically a dictionary of vectors. That's exactly the word embedding. And then, then there will be a vector that corresponds to two, and that will be, this vector will be something like, say, um, vector of a hundred dimension. And then we go through a simple projection. So this will be just um, some weights to learn. Um, input size will be 100 and then the output size will be again 100. And um, then output will be actually, oh my, my bad, 100. Um, input size will be 100 but output size will be the size of the vocab, the number of words um, that we are, we have, we want to um, consider in our vocabulary. So that would be something like, say, ten thousand. Then we will have ten thousand numbers, each corresponding to after um, uh, multiplying this matrix into this vector. So it will be, um, you have a big W, and then you have a small. W, right? Um, and uh, sometimes you put the bias too, but let's say we do not, we do not put bias at the end. Then um, this will be um, real number of 10K and each value in the real number is corresponding to um, uh, one word. So we have 10,000 words in our training data. And then we're saying that each dimension corresponds to uh, each word. In the vocab. Then what we're hoping is that now this each value, we want to maximize those values that you have seen um, in this window of five words. So that will be I, love, swim, and at, right? So those words will uh, we'll try to maximize this um, matrix. We have like two different matrix, right? One is the um, the W here, big W, and another is um, the, the, the embeddings for the words. So we have a one embedding of 100 dimension per word, and let's say we have 10K words here, then we'll also again have um, uh, 100 by 10K um, matrix, right, to learn. So, um, so that's um, what we're trying to do. So um, the skip gram is trying to um, predict what words are around us given the current word with a simple transformation of W. So uh, that was a concept, but so more mathematically. Now I'll be, be trying to more concrete about um, what it means to have a, a word embedding as matrix. So let's say that um, in the world, um, there are probably a lot of words, of course, but then let's say that during training, we have observed only um, 10,000 unique words. That's our, that will be our um, training data. Then, um, then what we're trying to do is that, let's say that the vocab is something like, we start with A and we have, I don't know, apps. Um, we go to something like, you know, car and then lastly like something like you know uh, zillo so this is our vocab and we're saying that the size of vocab will be um 10 000. then um we are initializing the um embeddings for each word so what we are saying is that let's say the the matrix is e and this e is um size of uh, 10,000 times 100. Here, 10,000 is number of vocabs. 100 is uh, each word's embedding size. Of course, usually this embedding matrix will be randomly initialized um, in the, in, uh, uh, initially. You probably learned about this in your deep learning class, hopefully. Um, then, then what we're trying to do is, um, when we are uh, mapping a word to on its word embedding is essentially um, what we're doing here is actually 
Let's see. Um, here's uh, something that you might be confused about, but um, let's say that the we had this um, uh, input, right? The input was. Um, I love to uh, it's list not set then um, in order to obtain the um, word embedding for I I love each word uh, to swim and at uh, you want to actually um, look up the embedding matrix and just get the embedding corresponding to that word, right? Um, so how can we do that? Um, of course, you can just program it so that you can just retrieve it uh, just like how you do simple um, DB access. But then um, you can put this in mathematical way. How you do that is that you map this X to um, uh, one hot vector. So I will, let's say that I is um, at location something like 500, then we want this to um, be a one hot vector. I'll put, I'll use column vector. Um, this will be just zero, zero, zero. And then you just have one at the, uh, the location that corresponds to I. And similarly, we will have swim that may be happening in the later, uh, of, in the later part of the vocab. So we have zero, 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 zero. And then at the later part, you have one and then zero, zero, something like that. So it's a one hot, right? Each is one hot. And then um, suppose that then these vectors are, um, uh, I'll just put this as, um, what is it? X O of one, X one hot, right? And this will be um, X four of a uh, one hot, right? X four, not four, X three, sorry. Then what you do is um, to obtain the embedding corresponding to each uh, one hot vector, um, it's exactly X, uh, the first, um, the embedding for the word I um, will be, I'll just not use the O if I'm talking about a real embedding. This will be exactly, um, you transpose E and then multiply this one hot vector. Do you agree with this? Then this will be in the dimension of 100, and then that's how you would translate the um, uh, word into an embedding, word embedding, using the embedding matrix. And you'll be asked to do this in your assignment. Um, you can do the similar thing. Um, X3 will be embedding transpose X30. And this will be, of course, again, hundred dimensional. Um, you can do the uh, same thing for rest of the uh, input words. Okay, and then once you obtain these um, um, embeddings for the words, now you can operate uh, the projection. And um, now the projection will be um, you apply W to X1, and this will be again you are mapping this to um, the vocab size um, vector will be 10K. And then um, uh, you want to make this into probably distribution because uh, predicting word each uh, predicting word for each time step or surrounding words, right? Is also classification among 10,000 options. So you just go through the softmax uh, of uh, WX1. This will be uh, probably distribution. So it's nice property we can operate with. And if we, now the you the part, this is a self-supervised, people call this self-supervised. Uh, in, in, in the older days, people called it unsupervised, but then now the trend is that it's not really accurate word of saying it because it's not really unsupervised because you're supervising something, right? Uh, it's more of a, you're supervising by yourself. So um, you see that there, there were no labels involved, but then basically guessing uh, the, uh, you're 
just covering words nearby and they're trying to guess that and trying to um, find the embedding and the projection matrix that actually um, does your task well is exactly um, self-supervision, what people call. And just one quick point, um, we're not going too much into the details of a SIBA and SKIPGRAM because uh, it's not used anymore. I mean, I'm not saying it's not at all, but uh, it's not oftentimes used these days. Um, but, but still, um, I just wanted to give you a more of a history that we just discussed SKIPGRAM, which is guessing words nearby rather than um, SIBA is more of a you just cover one word and then try to guess that word given the four words around it. The funny thing is actually SkipGram works better than CBAO in general, what people think, but then how the, um, um, the modern pre-trained language model uh, works is more similar to CBAO that they just try to mask a few words um, just to guess that instead of um, trying to predict surrounding words given one word. So there's difference, uh, they're very similar but opposite and SkipGram has the multiple outputs and actually this has some advantage uh, that you can actually have um, a stronger, more updates per input because you're guessing four words at one update instead of one word per update, which is the case in CBAO. So that, that's why what people think is the, the case why SkipGram is a bit better than CBAO. But again, I told you that the pretend language model works more like CBAO. So we cover this. So now we'll be going to, into this part, which is about using RNN. So I'll be, uh, we'll, let's just rest for, uh, let's just uh, have a break for um, about like three minutes. I'll be coming back at uh, 3.22 um, to start with the uh, uh, recurrent neural networks for the rest of the, um, the lecture, 30 minutes. Yeah, so break for uh, two or three minutes. Okay, welcome back. All right, so let's go into RNNs. So uh, for the motivation part again, so um, why is that the variable length is bad? 
um, when you're using simple neural net to do text classification. And um, it's actually not just really about uh, variable length, but um, it's also about the, the, the part, property of text that, um, just, just one second actually. Just one second. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, why is the variable length bad for simple neural? And it's not really only about variable length, but text has a really um, interesting characteristic that um, if you just like, for instance, add one word, it changes the meaning of the entire text uh, entirely. So it's very, um, I would say, discrete, um, unlike image, which is very continuous. Uh, just changing one pixel in image will not really change its meaning, but in text, um, if you just put, for instance, word not in front of any sentence, then it becomes negative, right? So it's very discreet and very, um, it flips really well. Uh, and also, um, here's a simple example why it's also an issue. Suppose that you just put one or two words at the front of this sentence. And if we use the same method that um, we just talked about, basically, um, can we just um, flatten out this input vectors into one vector? Then, um, of course, issue is that maybe um, because it's variable length, variable length, can we just, um, um, for instance, just um, get the first like five vectors for the input, right? So then, in that case, then what we would do is. Um, we just maybe use the first five and get some vectors and then just do um, some uh, projection, right? And you get some vectors and then you just uh, concatenate that into flatten out into one vector. But can, if you do the same thing here, Um, I'm, I'm just giving you an example for the first five words, but you can go on, right? Um, you can do the projection two here again. And flatten out to get one vector. But now you see that you just put one word here, but then these two vector will be widely different because um, you know it's shift by one, um, one, one word vector, right? Um, the who, this part will be same as this and this part will be same as this, but in vector space, this is like entirely different thing. Now you see what, what the problem is. If you have this variable length and it can be, um, you know, it, does, it, does, it didn't change the meaning at all though, but this is really bad, um, especially more bad for the text when we are using word embeddings or text classification. And also of course, um, the length has changed too. So um, it's not super intuitive how we can handle this um, longer sentence or even you know shorter sentence, right? So and that's exactly the problem with using anything um, as simple as simple neural networks for um, text. It's even worse than image. Although in the image, um, people also uh, used CNN more um, than um, dense or just simple neural net, mainly because CNN has um, some invariance in the um, 
many invariances that we can utilize for the images. And si similarly, we need some invariant um, component when we are modeling text. And that that's exactly the motivation of uh, recurrent neural networks. So um, as you see, um, what we do here is that instead of um, uh, just operating between um, the input and the output, which is basically vertical in this case, right? It's vertical. But also we want to encode the dependency in the time axis or the um, horizontal axis. And how we do that is that uh, we try to reuse um, a module that's not only dependent on the input, but also the output of the previous time step. So here, the, um, for instance, um, x t minus one can be the first word, x t can be the second word, x t plus one can be the third word. And the, and the good thing about this is that if this works, you can just unfold it as many times as you want, um, um, even though you have just a fixed number of uh, parameters to use, right? Um, it's not increasing the number of uh, parameters. Uh, you just reuse your parameter again and again. So, um, so we see these like a matrices here, right? So we have a U, um, V, and W. So um, what that means is that um, H, T minus one is just simply, no, actually I'll go with the HT. So we have the same W, U, and V for um, the HT. And what that means is that these are matrices that you want to learn. Um, and how you define them is that uh, you were saying HT is equal to your first want to do a similar thing as you did for the, um, um, the like really the vanilla neural network, which will be um, something like U, um, U of uh, XT plus bias. Uh, but you also want to um, add the transformation coming from previous time step. So it will be um, V of X, no, not X, sorry. H T minus one uh, plus some bias two. But of course these two bias can be just combined into one, right? So it's just simply U X T plus V H T minus one plus B. So now you see again that this part is what's recurrent because you are using the previous in previous output of the, it, the, the current model as the input for the, um, um, the current time step. And um, that sounds great, but we see there is something missing. Um, what's missing here, of course, um, if you just do this way, then everything will be just linear. Um, of course, um, I'm not saying linear is bad. Uh, linear is uh, sometimes very useful, but uh, as we saw, um, just multiplying several linear uh, matrices is just an, another linear matrix. So it doesn't actually allow us to model complicated, especially um, um, very um, discrete behaviors of neural nets. So what, what, what we need is, um, uh, so the problem here is that, um, so uh, I'll just write this down again. Next T. Okay, but um, problem here is that then uh, what will be H T plus one? And we can um, substitute H T which will be
right? And um, if you expand this again, right? And as you saw, as you see, this is just basic linear combination. I mean, linear um, um, some combination of xt plus one, xt, and ht minus one, and b of course. Um, if you just group this, it will be right. So um, it just it is it will be always linear. If you just uh, keep doing this, then you can generalize this into a uh, okay um, certain hidden state. Oh, H by by the way, uh, um, actually stands for hidden state. So a certain hidden state always. Um, linearly depends on the previous inputs, right? Uh, X t and X t plus one, previous and current inputs, and also uh, what the t minus h t minus one was. But um, if you just do this, uh, you keep doing this, then this will at the end will be um, h zero, and h zero is something some fixed value. So you can just say you can see that this is not really uh, it's just recurrent relationship. So what really matters is that this X t plus one X t, and xt plus one and xt are just inputs. So if you just do that, it's um, just a linear combination of the inputs. And again, you see that there is uh, some limitations. So um, we saw this exactly the same thing in the image classification, right? So that's exactly why we need some non-linearity in RNs too. So um, of course, the first thing we can think of is ReLU. Um, and remember that the ReLU is really simple thing. It's a max of zero comma x. And if you draw that, it will be that, right? Really simple um, function. What that means is that can we do this? Um, um, previously, before was that, uh, we are defining H T to be um, W. Actually, we didn't use the word W. Sorry, just to be consistent. Um, U of uh, X T plus V of H T minus one plus B. Right. But instead of doing that. Um, Using ReLU, we can have something like ht equal to, um, I'll just write ReLU. That's exactly the same thing as max of a zero and x. Um, right. So then now we are introducing some nonlinearity in the um, in the in the function. So that sounds that might sound great. Um, uh, at least we can be sure now that this is actually nonlinear. Um, if you actually compute for HT plus one, you will see that it's no more linear combination of inputs, which is giving us um, the room for doing more fancy things than uh, linear combination. But there's one really big problem that uh, ReLU, it, um, if you, it's applied to RNN, um, of course, not in general though, but it's applied to RNN, explodes or vanishes very easily. Um, why is that so? Because, um, so I'll give you just a very um, hypothetical case where um, W is um, uh, just simply, not W, I'm sorry, I keep missing up. Um, where the V is, the matrix V is what's getting multiplied to HT minus one, right? Um, or uh, the first time step. So let's assume that um, V, actually, so let's assume that uh, V is um, just composed of initially, Suppose some number that's um, smaller than 
one. So something like let's say that this was something like um, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.9, minus 0 0.3, etc. It doesn't matter. Um, so these, these, um, these, uh, you can, it, it, it can just lazily define this as um, something like um, 1.0, not, not equal to actually. If V is smaller than 1.0, then let's go back to our um, original um, definition. Then uh, what we can say is that, um, uh, let me see. If V is smaller than zero, although we have this non-linearity, max of zero and X, you will see that um, that zero will not be counting um, towards uh, basically nullifying everything to zero. Um, so it's not actually helping you at all, right? I mean, so for now then uh, what happens is, I'm trying to explain this mathematically that um, let's uh, define the HT again, an HT T plus one. And that was basically um, now again, max of zero and um, you had u x t plus one plus v of uh, h t minus one, not t minus one, my bad, it's t, the current t plus b, right? And if you just expand h t again, then um, this will be same here, but then now you're expanding this into VU of XT plus V square of uh, um, HT um, uh, minus one plus V plus one B, right? Um, so now you see that this uh, V square, this is really the problem, right? So, um, Actually, my bad. So actually, I forgot to put the max of zero and u. I will write this again. Um, v of max zero and uh, v h t minus one plus um, u of uh, xt plus v of ht minus one plus b, um, plus b, right? It's, it's getting very long. But what I'm trying to tell you is that um, for some components that's um, not affected by this zero. So in other words, suppose that um, this is just entirely positive. Then uh, we can reduce that to um, V square H T minus one um, plus V of uh, plus one of B and plus V U X T, right? But the problem here is that this part, right? This V square, um, that two is coming from um, two unwrapping of H T. So what if you try to go more? Like, I mean, what would be the, uh, the coefficient here? Um, so it will be something like, um, not something like, but it will be exactly V of N plus one if you're computing on dependency by T minus N, right? If T minus, if one is, um, if T minus one is um, unfolded again one more time, then it will be V of a uh, power of three, H T minus three. It's T minus two. So you can say that V of N plus one, H of T minus N. And what's wrong with this value? If you keep multiplying itself um, with uh, this n plus one, then um, you will actually, um, it will the, the, the value that your dependency will like basically vanish, right? Um, but that's maybe not too much a problem at least because you are not too much problematic with that. But real problem happens when uh, it's the other way. Um, if V is too large, 
right? What if V is like uh, bigger than Even if this is a really small value, you will see that um, if um, n goes up, then this value will be going to really large numbers. And if it's like two or three, then you're gonna really explode it like really easily. Like what's two, two like three to the power of 10? Um, then three to the power of 10 is something like, um, two to the power of 10 is like 1000 and 1000 is a super large number. And um, of course, uh, when you're training deep neural networks. So um, it explodes or vanishes easily, but really the problem here is that actually the explosion is super um, easy. That's what I wanted to say. Um, I'm not talking about gradient, uh, gradient explosion or vanishment yet, actually. Uh, gradient exploding and vanishing, we'll see that soon actually with the, um, uh, um, another activation function that um, it's a bit better value which is uh, exactly um, 10H activation. So 10H activation is at least better than ReLU because it's bounded, it's not unbounded. Um, ReLU was this, right? That was ReLU. And now 10H has a nice property that first of all, it's unbounded, uh, it's bounded. So it's more controllable. And number two is, of course, the good thing, good, good part about this is that this is like signed. It's actually a nice property that we'll come back later why it uh, could be a good thing, but um, basically it could be minus one or plus one. So it's also a good thing is it's signed. And bounded makes it not uh, easily uh, explode um, when you are doing anything um, during inference. So, and um, if you actually draw this um, graph on any like Google plot, um, then you will see that it looks just like this. And it's very nice. It's asymptotically approaching 1.0 and negative 1.0. So um, what, I mean by, what I mean by that is um, instead of using ReLU, what uh, we usually do is when you're defining uh, RNN, you're using, um, no, why? So we uh, let's go this from the beginning where we define the RNN as um, U of X T plus V over H T minus one plus B, but we put the value there. But instead of doing that, what we're saying is that we want to put 10 H. So then now we are adding some nonlinearity. Uh, we have a nice property that this output will be always bounded between negative one and one. And um, then at least we'll not explode the values. Um, then that's really bad in general. So, um, and also in the value case, um, um, as I mentioned, when you are when you have zeros, then basically you just uh, nullify everything into zeros. But here you're not really saturating into zeros easily. I mean, of course, if you're at um, here, it's zero. But good thing is that it has a really high um, slope. So it'll, it's, it's not, it's not going to stay there. That's what I'm saying. It's not going to be saturated to zero. It'll be always moving towards either to the left or right. So that's a nice property of uh, RNN. Um, so that's really nice, right? That's really nice. Um, but um, there is actually one more issue. So RNN with 10H actually just went through that. Um, but there's one issue actually, and that's called um, exploding and vanishing gradient problem. So now we're not talking about the actual inference values that we're exploding or vanishing. Um, um, actually, sorry, so it doesn't explode. Uh, vanishing still can happen a bit, but it's not too bad. Um, so it doesn't explode the values. And vanishing when you're doing inference is not too much a problem though. I mean, it could be uh, not good property, which is why people um, came up with attention mechanism, but still it doesn't make the model unstable, but exploding is a really bad thing. Um, so RNN with 10H activation doesn't explode the values. Um, but the real problem here is that it can explode or vanish 
its gradients during training. So to really explain this, we need to be uh, more formal about what it means to train. Uh, um, I'll be briefly going over the what's backpropagation. That's uh, the core part of uh, deep learning, uh, deep neural network training. And uh, during that, uh, we'll see that how it actually um, RNN with just 10H activation explodes the gradients or vanish the gradients. And we can actually drive that mathematically as well, just like how we did today. And this motivates actually uh, what's called gating mechanism as seen in LSTM and JAWU. Um, LSTM is coming from uh, 1997. Um, um, and also JAWU is coming from um, 2014 relatively uh, recently. Um, which is a um, sim simpler version of LSTM. And it's believed that LSTM and you have um, um, performance-wise not too much difference, but I think some people also say LSTM is a bit better than JRU. Um, in any case, um, RNNs are not uh, being used uh, as much as uh, back in like 2014, 15, 16. Uh, these days, Transformer um, has replaced kind of all these. But we'll cover these RNNs in the next class. And I'll try to give you some code examples, um, more um, concrete hands-on examples so that you can actually start with the assignment soon after next week's lecture. All right, so um, today's lecture will be, uh, will end here. I'll see you um, next week, Monday. Thank you all.